I was, I was just about to exhibit for the second time at Chelsea Flower Show when I received a phone call from Neil Mattinson asking me if I'd be interested in joining their team um, bid, and their bid for the, for the Olympic Parklands and um, of course I said yes but I, I thought nothing more of it. Um, I was aware that the landscape architects needed to fulfil a certain cr criteria they need, they, um, which was set by the ODA. So I knew that they needed to have you know, a certain amount of ecologists, artists, up and coming garden designers and so on. And I think I was quite sceptical, I knew there'd be a lot of sub-consultants and besides that they had to win the contract. I'd never, I'd never really considered working with landscape architects before. Um, I'd joined um, teams of architects, but working with landscape architects was definitely a new thing. And I have to admit, at that point, I wasn't sure what I'd bring to the table. Um, I didn't really understand the the sort of subtle or the kind of differences between the two professions, and. Um, I was quite quite sceptical. I thought, well, first of all, they've got to win win the competition, and then I've got to see if I'm actually going to be kept kept on board. And in fact, once I received a phone call and they said, well, we've actually been asked to design the whole of the park, not just the South Park, which we were bidding for. Even then, I, I and you know, come in and um, come in. We want to meet you and. We want all the sub consultants to sort of be briefed. Even then, I was very skeptical. Um, probably, you know, for the first year, um, sort of until <laughs> until the actual design of the gardens kicked in, just because of the sheer administration of. I, I'm not sure how many sub consultants there were, but probably nearly a hundred. Mm. Have to ask Neil. Um, and I, I was definitely the youngest by a long shot and least experienced. So. Um, in a sense, I had nothing to lose. Well, I, I was given a... Um, the contracts were slow as well to be, to be formalised and so maybe that was another reason why I was quite sceptical. Um, it was good from the point of view that I was a sub-consultant. I mean, a, a, a sole trader trying to deal with the huge administrative tasks of the Olympic Parkland and how you all how you work together. I mean, it was fantastic that we had LDA taking that um, pressure off our shoulders. I think I think the same. Um, I think professors at Sheffield University would have felt exactly the same. I mean, and making sure that you had the right um, insurance, you know, the right that that was helpful because even even with that help, there was of course a lot of the design aspect of the project was minuscule compared to the kind of day-to-day -day runnings which is I suppose completely normal. I was um, from the outset I was told that they wanted to create some gardens so they weren't this they were maybe called the Olympic Gardens at that point and it was just this vague kind of area which would be near the Olympic Stadium um, it was all very surreal because you couldn't visit site, or I did have one visit to site, but that was in a coach with kind of steamed up windows, and you weren't allowed out, um, which you you know, which you really need to do. You, you you can't get a sense of a place from kind of driving around in a coach. And besides that, there were hundreds of miles of pylons and. Um, so, so it, everything was was definitely quite sketchy at the beginning. My role was sketchy. I could see sub certain sub, uh, sub consultants weren't being used or weren't were leaving leaving the the team, and so I felt that I had nothing to to lose, and I was as a result I was very bold with my ideas. I thought, well, what can I bring to the table? I've got a fine art background, I, 
I love being creative, I love coming up with ideas. I'm just going to put my proposals forward. Um, and yes, some of them are quite different and if I get a negative response, well that's fine. I quickly understood my strengths and what I could contribute to the team. I think I was lucky because I was an outsider, I could go in for the meetings, I could go back to my studio and I could have creative space away from the kind of restrictions of a large commercial practice and I could you know, email my ideas across, my sketches and sort of stand back from it and wait for the response and um, I think that that really helped give me a voice. Also I quickly realised that I was strong at visually communicating ideas so a lot of the experiments that James and Nigel have been working on for years I understood their methodology and what it would look like um, and could draw it you know and could put it together as a proposal which would be accepted maybe by people that didn't have as much understanding of planting and also there's cultural differences in our understandings of planting and you have to remember that this was a you know part of the team was American Hargreaves Associates and part were from the UK and so in a sense we had this kind of cultural difference. I was first approached at, in April 2008 I think it was to join the, the yeah. project and then I started working probably in late June 2008 on just putting together statements and visuals of just throwing ideas on the table and then there were a lot of meetings and a lot of there was a lot of meetings and a lot of kind of convincing to do before I started doing the design in December 2000 and not two, December 2008 and that was the design was done over a very short period of time like sort of two weeks for the gardens because it felt like a very slow build up and then suddenly there was a deadline. It's really fascinating, it's, I think it's fantastic, fantastic to be able to collaborate with landscape architects because you basically both share an interest and a passion for creating places, for landscape, for, for, for plants um, and yet you come from it from different angles and so you have a lot to contribute. I think there's a mutual kind of crossover of ideas and I've gained insight into their working practices and you know what I can take away and apply to my own from observing them but I can also sort of hopefully likewise they can take there's a mutual exchange of ideas. I mean, I think it's like any discipline, if you're visual or design discipline, collaboration is good. Different backgrounds equals a richness of ideas and exchange. It was mainly, I think we would, because we were trying to do something different that hadn't been done before, because there were so many people that were really interested in the gardens. These were going to be really, well, these are really high profile plantings. Um, it was, the approval pro process was quite complex. Um, everyone wanted to have their say. There were a lot of different things that had to be considered in the brief. And so I felt like I was definitely trying to bring all these different aspects together, which in a sense, sometimes you have to compromise a little bit of what you want to do. But ultimately, James, Nigel and myself are really passionate that this should have naturalistic feel. It shouldn't be planting in just straight linear lines. And so the approval process was, I would present to LDA and Hargreaves. And then they would take my drawings and ideas and present to the ODA and then I think later on I was brought in to present um, 
but it was very much about convincing the head designer, um, George Hargreaves, um, because obviously it's going out. He was the design lead. It's going out in his and LDA's name, and they have to be 100% sure of you know, what you're doing. We were given a brief by the landscape architects to create cosmopolitan gardens, which would be incredibly colourful and peak at games, and which would have some sort of world context. And so I think it was James came up with the idea of of um, plants and how they were introduced into Britain through since the 1500s. So you'd get the first wave of plants coming into Europe and then you'd get the second wave um, of plants from the prairies and then the southern hemisphere plants were introduced sort of in the 1870s and then kind of to Asia is the kind of final introduction of plants. And of course history is not that linear and there's these kind of um, crossovers during that period and but I think the key driving force between the concepts for the concept um, was really the spectacles was really um, trying to bring the spectacle of how plants grow in their native environment to the park to ordinary gardeners that will visit the gardens I mean for instance um, not many of us. I haven't been to to America and seen, you know, the prairies. And I think we really just wanted to to give an impression of the scale of the spectacular. We really wanted to create um, a spectacle which would normally be reserved for plant explorers um, travelling in really remote areas of the world. We really wanted to inspire people and to make them understand, look, these are ordinary garden plants, but look where they've come from, and to create a very stylized version of, of those natural habitats. We have, in Europe, we chose to stylize a lot of the planting on European hay meadows, um, sort of moist hay meadows, so you have species typical to those um, growing conditions like you have Sanguis sorba officinalis, um, Deschampsia, Cespitosa, Millinias, um, Telechia speciosa, um, and then in North America, of course, the main stereo sort of typical or the main um, blueprint habitat, as you like, was 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 the prairies and um, North American prairies and you have things like the sylphium and then the very familiar echinaceas or coneflowers and um, asters and, and more, more unusual species that people wouldn't normally see like um, Aeschylepius incarna or even you know Echinacea pallida with the lovely drooping pale pink petals and then in the southern hemisphere, the planting is really more from moist montane kind of grassland meadows. And you have wonderful, quite subtle grass like um, the Medra, the Medra, which is um, which turns bright red in South Africa, and the whole mountainsides kind of turn red in the winter. And so you have this kind of habitat of low tussocky grasses, but you also have these kind of very perennials with naked stems or leafless stems um, which kind of emerge out of this like kind of lower strata of tussock, tussock grasses um, mainly to sort of stick their flowers up in the air and encourage um, birds to, to, to pollinate them. And then I suppose the Asian zone is more distinct visually. It's um, calmer and lusher and it peaks a little bit earlier when all the iris chrysographies, <laughs> all the iris are out in flower and they've got the wonderful inky black flowers. Um, 
and so that was supposed to be a calmly calmer space with lilies and a giant hosta tall boy and um, hackaneculum macra large calm swathes, swathes of it There weren't as many climatic challenges as people assume, um, partly because the site of the 2012 gardens is south facing and it's also sloping, which, which really helps with the drainage and because, because all of the soils were um, made to spec, so we could specify exactly what conditions we wanted. For instance, um, What's really important in the Southern Hemisphere zone is that all those plants get really, really good drainage. It's not winter, it's not the winter cold that will, will kill them, it's, it's the winter damp. Um, I mean, some of those plants, a lot of those plants, will survive minus 20 degrees Celsius in their native natural habitat, but the drainage is so sharp and so as an extra precaution, we specified that there would be a, layer, a mulch of sharp sand in this southern hemisphere area as well as in the North American area. So I think that was about sort of 70 to 100 mil thick layer of sand. And I think the plants, you can really see that they really because both those drainage is essential for both of those areas. Um, and so they've really, really thrived in that. And then in the European and um, the Asian gardens, the soil mix is, I think it's the same, although they do, but, but there isn't the sharp layer of drainage and of course there's irrigation as well. And the early rainfall actually was quite beneficial um, because it meant that you didn't have to really delay the flowering. I think because because the drainage had been considered, because the drainage was so good in in, in the south, the southern hemisphere and the North American sections of the garden, the rainfall didn't matter. I think it was more unexpected. Um, sometimes you get unexpected runoffs from the concourse because you have such a huge expanse of of concrete. Of course, you get sort of there were a few swales of water that would a few kind of lines of water that would create swales, particularly because the gradients of the garden are, are rather steep in certain areas, so that, that's probably been a little bit of an annoyance for the willoughbys who have to maintain the gardens. And we all had input into the maintenance schedule. Um, I'm not sure at what level it's detailed at, and I think there's only so far sometimes you can go with those schedules. You're never going to, um, the benefits of having the designer on site, having a dialogue with the gardener is, I mean, you're never going to replace that. Um, and it's been really fantastic during the process um, to oversee the implementation of the gardens. I haven't been on site nearly as much as I would have liked to have been, um, but I think it's it's a fantastic dialogue. You want to be talking to the gardener, you want to be discussing how individual plants are performing and how the overall picture is coming together. And um, I'm hypersensitive to, to the design, I suppose, but I can see areas where I've been there overseeing the layout of the gardens and areas where well, the majority of it has just been laid out as per the plan, but of course there's always going to be changes on on site, and especially when you have a kind of curvilinear gardens. The gardens are curvilinear, and so and they've got these terraces, and yet they've got these straight lines, and they've got these kind of lines of planting that come off the the terraces, and it's very subjective what you do along those curves. You can't always accurately measure things out and certain things on site change so you have to adapt. So I, I think you can you can never get away from the designer being on site, I mean the benefits. There's certain species in the mixes which will become dominant. The most um, obvious I suppose is the leucanthinum um, or kind of 
the form of oxide daisy in the European gardens and um, a lot of that will have to come out because it is really vigorous and it will it will swamp more delicate plants like the Trollius europaeus and um, the globe flower um, and other kind of um, even the yeah chalcedonica so it's more about having having garden ma having a maintenance team or having a head gardener that is sensitive to how the plants are growing is sensitive to the balance of species i mean if you look at an ordinary meadow you see that the you see that the species um, percentages or the kind of patterns fluctuates year by year you know certain species will be dominant and then it will retract and another one will be but um, I think it's being aware when a plant is taken over and kind of taking that plant back and it's also having an understanding for the design um, that's really necessary in the ongoing maintenance because the garden has been laid out if you like as this kind of field of planting and then there's these overlays which I designed over these 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 fields of, of plants which have um, maybe naked stems or leafless stems and lower flurry of leaves at the bottom and, and, and leafless stems that come up and can emerge through these layers of planting whilst allowing sunlight to percolate down um, and it's really the maintenance team really have to have an understanding of the design and there was I mean certain areas where I was hoping that certain maybe just simple strips of planting would fade into this kind of field mix and um, it's kind of maintaining that balance between the strip and the field which even now I look at it and I go oh I wish you know those that that kind of mono strip of grasses could actually fade blend better into the field so it's 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 really it's asking a lot of a head gardener it's asking that they're very sensitive to each plant and how it's growing and interacting within the community of plants it's been designed as a community of plants rather than as individual species and um, also looking at the overall picture of the gardens and making sure that that balance of structure and wilderness is maintained. I think the biggest challenge was trying to convince people to to, to experiment with plants and, and to go with these this kind of naturalistic style of planting. That was the biggest challenge. Um, it's also been challenging because certain things certain things on site have changed. Um, for instance, Europe was suddenly extended, but then you have yeah, it sounds so Europe the, the European zone was was extended and um, yet your kind of procurement had already gone out for, for certain species and things so you're you're very restricted in bringing in a new change of pace in the planting or new plant mix and, you ha and so you have certain sort of limitations like every project. We didn't realise that certain buildings would go up around the 2012 gardens for instance the orbit um, the plans for the orbit kind of came were put in place after the design of the 2012 gardens but actually that was a fantastic in my point um, from my point of view a fantastic um, bonus really because it, it, it obviously there's going to be more people coming to that part of, of the park and it sort of ensures the legacy of the gardens I, I or you hope it um, strengthens the legacy of the gardens and their future care and then there were certain challenges like the the BMW stand which is floating alongside the European gardens that was being built and that was unexpected and so the access to that garden was restricted which um, limited the, the maintenance of it. The changes to the planting palettes, I think that will really depend on the team maintaining. I mean, obviously, it will depend on the team maintaining the gardens. Um, it will depend on the passion of the head gardener, really. I would say, 
probably even, you know, 80% of the design is in the maintenance of any garden almost. Well, it depends on the garden. Um, but ideally it would be a head garden that's very sensitive to the growth patterns and the overall kind of community of plants and how they interact with each other. Um, obviously, I would assume that the planting palettes are simplified. That's just a general assumption I would make. Um, that certain plants, maybe like the lucanthinum in Europe, would be taken out or significantly reduced. I would hope that the opportunity would be seized to create kind of a um, internship or some sort of learning facility because a lot of the plants that have been put in the gardens are are really unusual um, and have been brought directly um, you know have been brought from Sheffield's um, research um, research plots and, and aren't widely grown and it, it would be a kind of opportunity lost if 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 learning was important into the interplay. I had a good idea about what the gardens would look like and that's partly because small, of small scale innovations that I'd been undertaking in say private, cli private clients gardens um, or the, the experiments that James and Nigel have been doing at Sheffield and, and our general discussion of the kind of what's going on in horticulture across the world. Um, we were looking a lot at Hermanshof, Cassian, Cassian Schmidt's garden at Hermanshof in Germany and these kind of this movement of creating plant mixes and um, but I think the innovations the what was innovating about the gardens is that we applied these like if you'd like small scale experiments to a larger <laughs> definitely more public kind of arena um, and as well as doing that we deliberately try to combine it with um, planting which we're kind of culturally more used to like uh, simple strips of planting so simple strips of millennia or or um, a mix of maybe three or four species and what we were I think um, what's kind of innovative about the gardens is that we're kind of moving from this very complex field of planting which is structured like a meadow stylized meadow and we're trying to combine these kind of simpler palettes and we're trying to kind of create these overlays and fades and dialogue between the two so it's not like here is one area of mono planting and here is a meadow it's a kind of a more of a subtle gradient I felt like I was definitely knitting together different ideas absorbing I felt like I was definitely absorbing the different criteria that were coming into play because on a large project like this you're always going to have slightly different briefs or slightly different you know from from surrounding you and in a sense you've got to make sure that you're creating a unified picture and one that's sustainable and one that will um, perform for the deadline and so I think Without, I was very persistent in in presenting the ideas. I was very persistent in drawing them up, even a bit manipulatively, to get the site to be so, so that the gardens would be signed off, so that we could we could go ahead and and not be too restricted. Firstly, it's a huge, complex project, and there's never going to be an exact replica of it and the process has been quite gruelling at certain times as well as really incredibly rewarding. Um, I've definitely grown in confidence and just the professional partnerships that you form are fantastic and you, you definitely, um, it definitely allows you to re recognise sort of patterns in future projects that will come up. I've definitely learnt, I think, when there is such a huge team, you have to be really bold, you have to you have to speak out. And almost 
I've sort of observed in others as well, there's almost a relief when people do come up with strong opinions or, you know, say, no, I really passionately believe in this. Because there is a danger when you have so many restrictions, so many deadlines, schedules, programmes of work, that you can kind of just get absorbed into this, um, this kind of administrative infrastructure. And working on the Olympics has reinforced my belief in, you know, it's really important to have a physical creative space to step back and to have a voice and to back up and to be really creative and innovative as long as you've got the kind of backup material to, to, to reference and to communicate your ideas. Uh, I'm, I just hope that the surrounding community embraces it and, and, and uses it. I think the first sort of six months during, the, I think the first six months will be really crucial to see how, you know, whether people, how people treat, treat the park, whether it gets off to a good start. Um, but that's what I'm really hoping. I'm really hoping that it gets off to a good start and that people really enjoy it and are proud of it because I think that kind of really sets the future, the future up. Um, and of course, I, I would love there to be a lot of investment in the gardens and, and for them to be uh, for them to be kind of a horticultural showpiece you know. it's <laughs> it's been fantastic to watch the process from even like grading the soil so you I designed the gardens and then um, we had a site visit and we were pacing out where the terraces would go once you know the, the, one of the most exciting parts was when actually the soil was graded very slightly into how how the terracing would be and we could kind of walk the distance it was just a blank canvas of soil on <laughs> in different gradients and um, throughout it's been you know it's always quite a surreal experience visiting site you have your high-vis jackets you have the noise and then towards the opening of the games you hear these beautiful choir kind of coming from the main stadium you're like right this is good and I was always aware of the presence the fact that there were but there were no people in the gardens and actually visiting the park and seeing it used seeing people in the garden seeing young children run along and you know roll down the grass terraces and gardens need people to be in them and to be enjoying them and and otherwise they sort of feel a bit soulless um, and so that's been fantastic and it's just been interesting watching how people respond to the gardens of course they're going to go for the kind of colourful combination of like Verbena bonariensis and the golden cones of Rebecca Maxima you know there's it you always know you've done well when people are having their photograph taken <laughs> with a backdrop of flowers behind them um, I suppose I'm probably look at the gardens with the most, with a very. I look at the gardens as a work in progress. I think you have to. They're gardens. They're always evolving, and there's lots of things that I would like to do. But that's the nature of of the kind of discipline that we work in. Um, I mean, the gardens are incredibly long. They're half a mile long. But they're very narrow in places. Um, they, they kind of maybe go down to 20 metres, in cer and certain parts of the borders are, are you know, a couple, three metres wide or, or less even. So there's a lot of a lot of things that people can take away, lessons that people can take away from the gardens, and apply to their own spaces. Um, I mean, you could look at the individual plants, and say, well, you know, I really love that. Calihera bushy, I've never seen that grown before, doesn't it scramble over the aster beautifully? And so there's, there's very small things that people can take away, like um, how to grow that. It, it just depends on the level at which you're reading the, the landscape or the garden. 
the landscape um, LDA and Hargreaves Associates did a fantastic job in designing the terracing for the Olympic Gardens, all the ramps and the series of steps, and that gave me a really strong framework to then design within. Um, it's also fantastic talking to them because they had the overall vision of the park. You know, they were able to sort of, they were involved in the whole scheme, and so. I mean, obviously, when you design, you want to look at the wider context, and the landscape architects really, throughout the process, and, and it's kind of a continuing up to this present day, really helped, helped um, you to see the overall vision of the park. I mean, they were involved in all the detailing, all the, the wider meadow mixes, and just having a team which really understands the overall vision is incredibly important when you're designing a specific area. Um, also for things like um, you know the biodiversity action plan, they need and the species quotas and it was it's it's like a kind of a it was a, a massive support um, and it was it's it's like anything you don't design in isolation there's a dialogue that happens and if you've got slightly different backgrounds or you're working in a different area of the park or you've been involved in um, some different series of meetings we've got def different specialism then then of course you're going to bounce ideas and and the design is going to kind of gain from from that pool of knowledge and they were just I think uh, for me it was the support that was the biggest the support from the landscape architects from LDA they were incredibly supportive throughout the process and that was the biggest kind of for me, that was the biggest um, positive, really, for that because you've got to have a supportive working environment to do new things and to feel like you can be creative and 